it's about time to get started. So uh, today we're going to be finishing up chapter 11 on the small end designs. So uh, these are these experimental designs that have you know, very few subjects compared to most of the ones we've been talking about. So maybe one, two, or three subjects, or four in one example we'll be seeing today, but still relatively small number. So let's take a quick look at our objectives for today. Uh, now, toward the end of Wednesday's class, we started talking about multiple baseline design. And I mentioned that there were three um, different varieties of those that we were going to talk about. And we talked in some detail about one of those, but uh, we didn't get to finish covering that. So we'll talk more about those today, and I'll give you a couple additional examples. <coughs> And then we'll talk about another type of small end design called a changing criterion design, which uh, it's an interesting twist on things that uh, you'll see ties pretty closely back into B.F. Skinner's work that we've been talking about. And then toward the end of class today, we'll wrap things up by talking about uh, how to evaluate these small end designs, and, as well as case study research. So case studies. Uh, are just one single subject in a very detailed study of that individual. Uh, and we'll talk about the strengths and limitations of these designs. So, they're not always the most appropriate designs. Sometimes they're the only choice, but we'll get into those details today. Oops. That's <laughs> no, okay. We'll set that back up. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. That should work. <laughs> Alright, so um, I've put this slide up toward the end of our class on Wednesday, so if you're here taking notes that day, uh, you should already have all these details, but I just wanted to reintroduce this idea of multiple baseline design, uh, or multiple baseline designs, and the fact that it involves, first of all, the establishment of a baseline. So looking at how someone normally behaves, and then uh, introduces a treatment at different times. That's where you get the idea of multiple baselines. <coughs> and, what's that? Uh, sure, or you could get them from me after class. It's, it's up to you. Yeah. So, in, let's see, on Wednesday we talked about this first type, the multiple baseline design, design that looks at one behavior across two or more subjects. Uh, does anybody remember the example that we talked about of that particular design? What's that? Yeah, it was the, it was the study of stuttering, right, or the, the stuttering treatment. So, if you recall, there were multiple subjects, and they all received this treatment to help them deal with their stuttering problems, but they received the treatment at different times, they had different numbers of therapy sessions, uh, and then it just followed them up, it established a baseline to look at how often they stuttered before the treatment, gave the treatment at different times, and then looked at the subsequent patterns of behavior. Okay. So uh, one particular behavior is stuttering with two or more subjects. Okay. And so uh, next we're going to look at these two alternatives, looking at two or more behaviors in one subject, and then looking at uh, one behavior in one subject, but across multiple different environments, right, to see if the treatment is specific, uh, specifically effective in one type of environment, or if it generalizes to other environments. Right. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this first kind, two or more behaviors with one subject. Now, the example that we'll look at here is one from sports psychology, which is a specific subfield of psychology that focuses entirely on uh, behavior and cognition and things like that in sports. So it's more specific than most of the sub-disciplines of psychology, but uh, it is a pretty popular one. I have a few students who are interested in this. So we're going to look at a study that uh, used as its dependent variable three different behaviors of uh, linebackers in football. Now, as, a, as you all know, I know practically nothing about football, so I'm going to do my best to explain this study to you. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, 
as we mentioned before, with these single subject studies, or these, uh, the small end designs anyway, uh, operational definitions are really, really important so that you can have a clear idea of how the behavior was measured in these people. Right? So they, uh, like I said, there are three different behaviors that they're interested in this one. Uh, there was the number of reads performed by the athletes uh, during a game and during practice. And this was defined as uh, covering a designated area on the field. So they supposedly the player would see that there is a certain part of the field that uh, needs to be covered, that you know, they can perform a certain function in that area, and they go to the appropriate spot. And then uh, drops, that was another behavioral dependent variable. So of course, uh, a lot of times when people are playing football, especially you know, with a big organization, uh, they'll have a playbook that the players are supposed to learn from, and then depending on the um, actions performed by the other team, there are certain plays that they have worked out that the players are going to execute. And so uh, this just measures how frequently the players executed the correct play according to that playbook. And then uh, the third behavioral dependent variable was uh, tackles. So how frequently the players successfully stopped the progress of one of the offensive players. Okay. So, as you can see, uh, these are three distinct types of behaviors that are being studied. And uh, this study that we'll see looked at uh, one specific individual. I think they actually looked at a couple of different players, but you can get the idea by looking at uh, one individual player. And so we've looked at the dependent variables, but we haven't talked about the independent variable yet, right? The treatment that they're providing to see if it affects these things. And that was uh, that they publicly posted uh, the results for each one of these variables. So essentially, they're publicizing the performance of specific athletes and posting it up in the locker room for the other players to see. Right? So I would imagine that this would make the players a little bit more self-conscious and a little bit more concerned that uh, about their own performance. And so um, they just wanted to see if this basic thing, having their performance become more visible in this public forum, would affect their actual performance on these different behaviors. And uh, they also looked to see whether the performance changes would generalize from practices to actual games. So they did actually look across multiple contexts, multiple environments. So in a lot of these studies you'll see a combination of different elements of the multiple baseline designs. But um, Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, results of this one. Right? So, I'm sorry this is a little blurry, but you can see this is the data for one participant, which uh, the researchers have codenamed John. We mentioned last time they don't always use participants' real names in these things to, in order to protect privacy. Uh, although this one's all about <laughs> publicity, so I don't know how much protection of privacy they were really doing here. <coughs> and so <clears throat> this is the initial baseline phase, uh, and this is the number of correct reads. So the player is seeing that they should be in a certain spot on the field and going to that spot. And you can see they were performing uh, these correctly from about 70 to 80 percent of the time. Right? And incidentally, these different dots, whether they're uh, filled in or not, reflect either an actual game or practices. And there are far more practices than actual games. So the solid dots are practices, the empty dots are games. Right? So it seems like this treatment is actually effective across both those contexts, game and practice, because the pattern is consistent. There's just one actual game down there where the uh, behavior dropped back down close to baseline. But this does look like after they started publicly posting the results, there was this marked increase in performance, such that uh, they're successfully reading the field 
almost 100% of the time, 90 to 100%, as opposed to 70 to 80%. Right? And then, of course, they have the additional dependent variables. Now, what you'll see is they looked at the effectiveness uh, of this at a different time. Right? So remember, multiple baseline designs introduce the treatment at various points. Right? So here we can see that uh, if the treatment is introduced a little bit later, they've still been recording the baseline the whole time, and this is looking at uh, drops, so uh, that was defined as uh, executing the correct play according to the playbook. And again, you see this consistent increase in performance after the treatment is administered, even though it's administered at a different time. Right? And then we can look at that third dependent variable, tackles, and because this is a multiple baseline design, again, the treatment is introduced at a different time. Right? And you can see uh, an increase afterwards. It looks like there might have been a little increase beforehand. This over here looks a bit lower than that. But uh, it's hard to say if that's significant. And as a matter of fact, that's one thing that we'll be talking about for the end of class that can be um, kind of a weakness of these designs. It's just a different aspect of them. A lot of times the analysis is done visually, so you're essentially eyeballing the results. They don't always use inferential statistics to look for significance, and they don't always do hypothesis testing. So it's fairly different from those other designs, as you can see. Another interesting characteristic of this one is that it doesn't look like there's a lot of variability in the results overall. I mean, you don't have dots all over the place on this one. It looks like you can either I mean, they're only measuring maybe 10, uh, 10 instances uh, across these sessions, such that people can only have values there, 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 you know, every, every 10. So that can sometimes be a problem for uh, certain statistical tests. But uh, when you're doing this visual analysis, I don't think it's as much of an issue. So any questions about this one? But the key point there is that we had three distinct behaviors. We had the reads, uh, the drops, and the tackles. And those were all examined with the uh, treatment introduced at differing times. And they consistently saw an increase in performance after that treatment was administered.